Well, hey, all you wiretappers out there, back here in the studio, Gangland Wire. Nice sunny day here in Kansas City. This is the second of a two-part episode with Andrew DiDonato, a Gambino family, the Nicky Carrazzo crew associate. And in this, he tells about a little bit a lot about his life, kind of getting into the mob, how they recruited him, how they groomed him. He, he tells in great detail, you got to wait a little bit for it, stick with it about doing a big bank robbery, which is really interesting how he did it. Then he ends up telling about how he ended up going into witness protection. Actually, he never went into witness protection. Uh, he lived in New York. I used to see him on Facebook every once in a while. I think he, if you remember from the last episode, he was talking about being in the car business. I think he's in the uh, car business. I need to get a hold of him and see how he's doing and, and what's going on with him because he's really a good guy. I really like talking to him and wouldn't mind talking to him to get a, an update on what's going on. You know, he was involved with Nicky Carrazzo and that crew during the time when Michael D. Leonardo ends up coming in and and he knew about that whole deal where John Gotti Jr. was going to uh, try to kill or actually he was only going to have him beat up. And then the guy tried to kill him, Curtis Sliwa. And so he was real close to all those guys that were close to Gotti. And and he was uh, I mean, he was in there and he was a moneymaker for him. And he, he got tired of being, you know, the guy that that made all the money. And, and while they got all the gravy and he took all the risk at the end, which is the way it is in the mob. Listen to this and and bear with it, especially if you want to hear about that armed robbery, because it's a great story. And he's a good storyteller, as you know, if you've listened to that last one. If you haven't listened to the one I put up before, go back and find it. And it's just like a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to put this up right away. Listen, guys, it's a good one. There really is no honor. There's no honor. These guys were robbed their own mothers with the lights off. There's a money on the table. There's no honor here. That's a fabricated thing. It's a fabricated thing to brainwash young guys like me to think that when they're out there doing these things, they're justified in their actions. For many years, I carried myself thinking I was part of this honor system. I was uh, wanted to be a man of respect. There is none. At the end of the day, when you realize who you are, Gary, you look in the mirror, and I'm a grown man, and I realize that knowing I am, I'm a criminal. Plain and simple. In, in New York, it was a little bit different. I never had a friend of mine or had any sort of knowledge about a guy having a judge. I did know that a few times, you know, jurors were paid, jurors were gotten to, you know, and that would happen in any big case, you know, yeah. witnesses were tampered with, you know, I myself tampered with witnesses in somebody's case to try to deter them from, you know, pointing people out in the lineup or doing something like that. Or in this case, we know of a case, uh, the first case that Nikki was on. They got pinched in 1987, and it was Nicky, John, Lenny. There was a few other guys. Tony Lee. I forget there was a few guys on trial back then, back in 87. Jamie Gravano was the one who found the Jora, and the Jora just happened to be a relative to an Albanian guy. They were able to give the guy 60000 and that's how they beat the first trial back oh. in 87. Oh, really? So in New York, it was a little bit different. It was more about the intimidation of the witnesses as opposed to having the court people in your pocket. No, because in New York, it seemed like those people in Chicago, they had that political system wired in Chicago. I did. I never knew about New York and there's a certain amount of corruption in any large city, but it doesn't sound like you guys. Yeah. Not in my era though. Not in, not in my era, Gary. And not in my area. Like in the eight, like I remember I was in the street from early, early 1980s from like 81, 82, all the way up until the late 90s, until I got locked up on my second case and went away. So during that time period, that's when the FBI and the government was putting a target on organized crime. Yeah. So there was there was no room for corruption then. Back then, there was just an all-out assault on organized crime back then. Yeah, it was, a, it was a big difference. You know, Rudolph Giuliani was the head prosecutor in the early 80s. Friends of mine were now going away when going away was never, ever even spoken about. These guys were, you know, never getting the time that they would once get for the same crime. Right. And that's what they did. They stepped up all of these protocols on the federal guidelines where years ago, before this, guys would do not even a third of what they're trying to give you on the first number. You know, now they're giving football numbers, 30 years, 40 years to start. Guys are they're shutting guys' lights with 100 year sentences or whatever. And at the end of the day, I mean, that's what's happening today. You see guys are going to go to jail for 100 years knowing that you're expendable, knowing that, you know, these guys are feeding you a lie. There really is no honor. There's no honor. 
These guys will rob their own mothers with the lights off. There's a money on the table. There's no honor here. That's a fabricated thing. It's a fabricated thing to brainwash young guys like me to think that when they're out there doing these things, they're justified in their actions. For many years, I carried myself thinking I was part of this honor system. I was a, wanted to be a man of respect. There is none. At the end of the day, when you realize who you are, Gary, you look in the mirror, and I'm a grown man, and I realize that knowing I am, I'm a criminal. Plain and simple. I'm not this honorable character that you see on TV or what they portray in the movies. I'm a guy who's told to do something, and I'm going to do it. And I'm only going to do it because it's self-preservation. So if my boss tells me to do this, it's done. You could be the nicest guy in the world, but if my boss tells me, break your arms and your legs, I'm breaking your arms and your legs because I know if I don't, I'm the guy you're going to see with his arms and legs broken. How did you first learn you were becoming expendable, Andrew? Went to prison. On my first case, I had a 5 to 15 year sentence. Was that on a bank robbery? No, that, that was on an attempted murder charge. Oh. I shot somebody. Okay. And I was away on that case. And during, on that case, my wife at the time was on welfare, Gary. My friends are stealing in the street. My wife's on welfare. My friends came to see me maybe once, twice a year, the first year, maybe once, twice a year, the second year, third year. I don't even think I got a visit. I used to get a Christmas card every year. Guys in the crew would sign it. They, at least you knew they cared about the guys that were away. But now maybe the gene pool changed or the way your life changed. Or I understand being in the street is difficult. I've been in the street my whole life. So maybe you just get distracted from being in the street. and You're worried about your own problems. You're worried about your friendships and your stuff when those guys get out of prison. I understand that. But at the end of the day, when guys are swallowing sentences and... You expect loyalty and you expect this. You've got to give something back. But that's what organized crime is, Gary. The guys at the top just take and take and take. And they don't share. And the only time you get to share in those prizes is if you get to those positions. Other than that, you're just going to keep on shoveling money to them and you're expendable. In every venture, you're expendable. Guys are fighting for their lives. They're away doing life sentences 20 years, 30 years. You know what's happening, Gary? Nothing. Nothing. They're away. They might get commissary every now and then. It depends what kind of crew you got. It depends what kind of friendships you got. Of course, that's also, that also plays into it. But for the most part, your wife's going to be on welfare. And if you don't have a pocket full when you go away where your wife can hold on to that money, you're in for a long ride. You really are. And that's definitely the myth. You keep your mouth shut, this is going to happen. And it doesn't. These days, you know what they do when you go away? Not only don't they take care of you, but these guys try to sleep with your wife when you're gone. Well, that's cold. That's how it's changed over the years. Boy, that is. Strange. That's a gene pool you're pulling from these days. Man. Listen, if you're still in the street and you're still stealing and you're still doing these things in 2017, you got to be a... I don't even know what to say. Because if you didn't learn from the years and years of all the guys before you who well, you might think were successful or the guys you think who weren't, you take the most successful organized crime figures you could think of. Think about where they are. Write them down on a piece of paper, and you tell me where they are. They're either in St. John's Cemetery in Queens. Where they died with a, with a gun in their hand. They died from, they got pulled out of a prison somewhere, and they died of old age, and that's where they rotted away from. There's no success stories, Gary. There's no success stories. There's no guy who, who did it all, and he lived to, to spend his money, and he lived to do this. Maybe one out of every 10,000. The other guys suffer. Their families suffer. Go to my old neighborhood where I live. That neighborhood's filled with single mothers that the husbands are never coming home. That's the reality of it. But these guys tell you what they want. You know, they're going to try to make out these stories to be fashionable or make them out to be honorable stories or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's a dirty, dirty life. A dirty life. I served... Four years, went on the work release program for the last, I want to say, 10 months, nine months, but I was still incarcerated. I had to sleep in the facility twice a week. I did that, and I didn't skip a beat, guys. I was home 24 hours. I was already robbing and stealing. As soon as I got let out, my, my job was a no-show job. I didn't have to be there. If my parole officer showed up at the job, they would call me. I would zoom to the location. Make like I was doing something, come up, and I'd be done. But I was stealing from the minute I got out, you know, because that's the life. You know, you belong to these people. Once you're back in action, 
then they use you again for what you're good at doing, whatever it may be. Because you spend all your money on lawyer fees, and if you have a family, your money's got to go to taking care of your family while you're away. But your money is done. It's going to be depleted, especially if you go to trial. I went to trial on my case, so I went I, I went for some money. And you got to survive week by week, incarcerated. It ain't like you're going to get a job there while you're incarcerated where you're going to be making money to take care of yourself. So money goes to them. Money goes to your family. Your family's got to eat. So when you come home, you're not going to have much. So you're going to have to start from scratch again. So it's just about, you know, starting over. I had guys from the Colombo family, guys from the Lucchese family, guys from the Genovese family. When I came home, they all came to see me. We went out to dinner. We did this and that. Every single one of them gave me a lot of money. Here's 500, here's 1,000, here's 10, 5,000, 10,000, whatever it may be. No, my boss gave me nothing. Biggest score we ever had, we robbed the, we robbed the bank in, uh, I want to say, it's English Town, I'm in Allop in New Jersey. We got a half a million dollars. Wow. When I committed that crime, Nikki had just got pinched. He got pinched three, within three months of that crime. He got pinched. I had some other issues. I was on the run at the time. When I committed that robbery, I was already on the run from law enforcement. So I committed that bank robbery when I was a fugitive from justice. Oh, wow. So I had a lot of problems then. I had the, F- I had the FBI looking for me, I had uh, New York State police looking for me, I had the parole department looking for me. I had a beef with two other crime families. You know, my life was my life was definitely in the balance at the time. That, that's what I we, was living moment by moment, not that, day by day. That's moment what by we moment. call that's what we call spinning out of control, I think. Describe describe that robbery. That sounds like it might be an interesting one. The robbery in itself went off like this, Gary. One of our crew members in the bank robbery crew who lived not even three minutes from the location. Him and his wife lived in an elderly community. 50 or older or 65 or older, whatever it was, he would frequently bank in this location. He's an old school bank robber. On the specific day when he would get his checks or whatever it is that he had to do banking with, he would notice that when the Brinks truck came, they would put the bags behind the tellers where there's no partition right behind them. And if the tellers were busy, they wouldn't get to the bags until they were free to do so. And they would take those bags in the back, load the ATMs or whatever else that they did. And he said that he noticed that when they had a cash a check, it was a holiday weekend, and he noticed that there was double the amount of bags than was previously. We went there one night. We looked at the location. We had lunch at a diner down the street the following day. We seen the truck on the path. We followed the truck to the location, seen them drop, made sure we seen all the moves. You know, you want to make sure that the truck driver is not G.I. Joe. He's not going to get out. You know, he's making ten, twelve dollars an hour and this guy thinks he's in Afghanistan. You don't want that. You want a guy who's a little bit more older, a little bit more lackadaisical, got twenty years on the job, you know, he's setting his ways. To him, it's not even money anymore. He's just moving product. Those are the guys you're looking for. Yeah, really. Anyway, these guys seem to be these guys seem to be on the job. We seen them do the same thing. We knew we had a score. We knew it was a done deal. The next week was gonna be the Labor Day weekend. We knew that they were going to get an early delivery on the Thursday before Labor Day weekend. During that time period, they put double the amount of money in the ATM machines because they have that much more of an influence of business during those four-day span. What we do is we go to the location early in the morning. My friend has his car. We doctor up the license plate with tape. We change the license plate number. We get into the vehicle. We got a crash guy across the street. We got our scanners. I put a bulletproof vest on. I gear up. I got a baseball hat, sunglasses. I got clear gloves on my hands. We pull up into the back of them. I walk in. Now, it was planned that I was going to walk in, don't talk to nobody, don't do nothing. As soon as they drop off the money and that guy, that driver gets back in his truck, I walk in. It goes off without a hitch. They come, they empty the truck, they put the money on hand cart, they push the money in, they go in, they put the money exactly where my friend said it would be. As soon as the guy gets in the truck, I walk into the bank, I walk in, I walk with my head straight, I don't look left, I don't look right, I... Am my eye on the target, I hit the counter, everybody starts, <gasps> uh, whatever. My other friend walks in two minutes later, he's my backup. I got no gun, I got no nothing. I'm there strictly for the money. Everybody's in shot. I jump over, I pull the first two bags. Now, you got to remember, the bags are put in like an electric blue square bag. They're about knee high. 
a little more than knee high. I put the first bag on the counter, the other two bags. All of a sudden, a good Samaritan comes running from the other side of the bank towards me, not knowing that this other guy is with me. As soon as he gets even remotely close to me, the guy grabs him and throws him across the bank floor. Everybody else is in shock. We take, I believe it was four bags in total. We take the bags, two and two, we walk out. Some other woman is walking in the bank. She sees us walking towards her. She starts screaming and she runs out of the breathing. So now over the scanner, when the call goes through, I come out after her. So whoever the witnesses were outside said that a man and a woman robbed the bank because they seen her running to the car first. <laughs> I go around the back of the bank. I put the bags in the trunk. My friend drives away. He looks like a grandfather's grandfather. So it took us about it took us about a minute to get to his house. We hear on the scanner that they pulled over this woman. They're going to take her to the police barracks in New Jersey. Now they're setting up roadblocks. We're already at our destination. We're good. I get in the house. I go into the bedroom. I take all my clothes off. I go into the shower. I shower. I put all my all the clothes from the robbery in a, in a garbage bag. I shave. I put new clothes on. I come back out. My friend's wife went out. She went and bought food. We're going to stay in the house a good five, six hours for sure till everything is good. We turn on the local news local news has the bank robbery roped off. We see it on the afternoon news. We're listening to it. We got it all over the scanners. My friend goes out to the car. He brings the bags in. We cut the bags open. The first three bags were filled with money. The fourth bag was filled with receipts. We thought the fourth bag had money in it. Turns out it had receipts in it. Make a long story short, we count the money. I think we get 480 Almost, almost five hundred altogether. Four eighty, four something, something like that. We do the cut right there. I take my money. I put it in a, a gym bag. Everybody takes their money. They go do what they got to do with it. We have a plan. We're going to meet that night. We're going to go have dinner. And we'll discuss the cut with all our bosses and whatever we're going to do then. I didn't want to be in the car with money, so we took all the money from all our cut, put it in one of the vehicles. We had one person drive that vehicle into Staten Island. I drove with my friend's wife alone. Being that I was the upfront guy, we knew they would look for me the most. So I was away from the money, whatever. We got to Staten Island. They dropped me off at my my place, got my money. I went about my business. Everybody went their own way to go to bury their money. Where were they going to go bury it? We'll meet that night for dinner. And that's how that ended. And then what happened was they had a, they took out a reward for us. My friend seen a reward of any information about the bank robbery. And it went off without a hitch. Everything, everything was cool with that. That was a successful bank robbery. Nobody got hurt. Nobody, and that's the way you want it, Gary. Yeah. No, we're there for the money. We're not there to hurt nobody. We're not there to whatever. We had one. I'll tell you one thing, Gary. We had one plan in place. And this was what it was. If we're ever in a police pursuit, it had to be three million or better. <laughs> for us to have a shootout with the police yeah. and go all out. If it's not $3 million or better, we give it up. And that really? was it. We'll run. We'll try to get away. Don't get don't get me wrong. Yeah. We'll try to get away, but we're not going to be in the shootout. But $3 million or better, if it was $3 million or better, we're going all out. We're going to hold court right there in the street and let the chips fall where they may. That was the game plan. Ever $3 million or better, we're going to be uh, an after TV, you know, a, a TV movie. We're going all out. We knew there was going to be a few hundred thousand in the bag. We didn't believe that it was going to be multi-millions. You know, if you get lucky, you get lucky. That's what we call it a score because you never know the exact thing. When you're doing all your reconnaissance work or, you know, you know you're sitting on the score, pretty much you got an idea of what you're going to be walking into. We had a clock for a few hundred thousand and we were right. Now, now getting back, you're, you're like out here, you're on the lam, you're doing bank robberies and Nikki's in trouble. Uh, he's, I think he's been, Nikki's in trouble. He gets pinched in Florida at the time. My friend Robert was murdered the winter before the score. That's score I just told you about. He was killed the winter before I was on the run from the parole department because they were going to question me about that. And some other, I was doing so many things, Gary, that I didn't know what it was. All the alarm bells were going off that it was going to be about this. Now, you know, this as a law enforcement guy that, if they have you on the suspicion of anything, they could they could take your parole away from you and hold you for like a 90-day period until they do an investigation or even hold you longer. They don't have to, you know, you're a ward of the state. They don't oh, yeah. have to tell you anything. They could right. just lock you up. No probable cause so or anything. So I was doing so good. Yeah, so I was making all this money. I wasn't about to give that up. I was like, no, no one I said, Gary. I said, let them earn their money. Let them catch me. <laughs> That's what I said. That was my mindset. Let these guys earn their paychecks and come and get me. Plain and simple. I had my lawyer call up the parole officer to ask what the what the detectives were doing there. He said nobody was here for him. We don't know what you're talking about. So my lawyer, who was Nikki Carrazzo's nephew, Jojo at the time, so Jojo told him, he says, if you're going to tell me fairy tales, find them yourself. You have a good day. And I was on the run from that moment on. Nikki was 
locked up, and we were we were getting bombarded. We were getting bombarded with uh, legal problems, and they caught me in '97, in early '97. I remember what the guy said when he caught me. He was like, "Well, we got you. Now we got everybody." I was it. I was the last guy that they were looking for that they couldn't find. As far as my crew, and you know, Nikki was pinched, Lenny was pinched. There was a few other guys that were pinched, and then that was it. And I was like, "Well, whatever, you know." <laughs> Yo, what are you going to do? They got you. It's over. It's done. And I was kind of relieved, Gary. You know why? Because I had so many problems in the street. And anybody who's been on the run knows that that kind of stress could kill an elephant. I mean, that the, the stress from being on the run is like, it's the worst feeling in the world. I think I told another reporter one day, I told him, I said, take your most stressful moments you've ever had in your life. Times that by 10,000. And that's one day on the run. Yeah. And that's one every, every minute of every waking hour of, of every day, you've got that twist in your gut. You're waiting for the shoe to drop. Yeah. You're waiting for the shoe to drop. Plain and simple. That would be tough. You know, I was fortunate enough in my life, Gary, where I made lemonade out of lemons. I had some fun. I I have some, t- some times that I could sit here and laugh about. But you need that kind of levity in your life yeah. to survive those hardships. Really? And even on the run, people say, how was it? Well, sometimes it was funny as hell. You know, sometimes yeah. you would just find yourself in the oddest situation, you know, and the times when you laugh are the times that get you by, like even when you're incarcerated. <laughs> I had fun with my friends because I was with similar guys with my situation, guys from different crime families when I was away. We would laugh sometimes for hours. And you're sitting there, not that I'm taking my situation lightly or not having any remorse for my crimes, but because if you don't, you're going to go insane. I didn't start thinking for myself as Andrew D. Donato until the day I started cooperating with the government. And everybody thinks that that decision came lightly. There were days I hated myself, never thinking that I did the right thing. But now, as the years go on and on, because so much time has passed, I realize that there would have been so much more in my life. Most of it, there weren't friends. There's no friends in that life. See, Gary, in my neighborhood, you can kill your best friend. And it's accepted behavior. Don't you dare tell on him. Tell me that's not the sickest thing that you could think about. It's okay to kill him, but you can't tell on him. Yeah, well, you know what? People will call me this, call me that, but at the end of the day, they were going to put me in a box. Right. So let, let's let's talk about I that. I took a the bit. best tools. Well, I took the best tools that I had at my disposal. And that, you know what that was, Gary? I beat them with the truth. That was the only thing I had on my side because I couldn't win that war. I was involved in a ton of violence in my life. I was no stranger to it. You want to go in the street and you want to go and you want to throw shots? Let's do it. I was the first one out the car. But I couldn't win that battle. I was in a situation where the boss of the family was looking to put me good night. There's no winning that because there's too many guys around you who you love and you trust who are going to be there to set you up only because they're trying to get a leg up in that life and prove to him that they could do these things. Guys that you went on dates with, slept over their houses, dated, dated people close to them, hung out with them, you know, Two, three o'clock in the morning, they were ringing your doorbell when they were impressed. And you were there, gun in hand. These are the same guys that are going to put your lights out. That's right. organized crime right there in a nutshell. Really? And, and what happens when he tells you, guys, think of somebody you grew up with. Think of a best friend you have or somebody who means the world to you. And then they tell you to go and you go clip that guy because he did A, B, C, and D. And you know it's wrong. You know you're going to hurt this guy for no other reason except that this guy has got uh, a conflict of interest or this guy and him, they butt heads. This guy didn't do nothing wrong. This guy might have been too good at his job, and this guy's jealous of it, or this guy just wants to take over his spots or his money. You know it's wrong. You can't say a word because then you're next. Nikki thought I was making this money with his robberies, and I was had these drug guys underneath me. And he didn't think he was getting a full piece of the action is number one. Number two, he knows I had information about the Robert Arena homicide that could put him right in the spotlight. When you have information about a boss, no matter how good you are to him, he can't sleep at night knowing you know this. You understand? You could be the nicest guy in the world. He knows that someday that it might not be. and He can't take that chance. And it's an old saying, it's always safer to send flowers. So you send flowers, and now you don't have to worry about that coming to bite you in the ass. Everybody in my crew knew it. Even the FBI knew it when they pinched me. They knew I was on an oxygen tank. They knew that these guys were going to kill me any day. They knew it. 
So if they know it, what are they? What are they, they? They woke up one day and they just got this information. They just the FBI just woke up knowing that I was on the hit parade. No, because it's out there. People talk when they're not supposed to. It's just common knowledge. People talk about things every day. The word was out there, and I wasn't in good graces with him. So be it. Would I have ever thought to do anything to hurt him? No, I would never. But when I'm facing 50, 45, 50 years, and I know that I'm going to come home to a bullet at the end of it, or they're going to try to kill me while I'm incarcerated, all bets are off now. I'm protecting the same people that want to put me to sleep. I'm not justifying my actions. Because I grew up knowing the game, and in the game I know, you don't do this. You gotta eat your own arm. At least if I'm gonna die, it's gonna be on my it's gonna be on my terms, nobody else's. How they made their approach was when I when I got locked up, they found me. When they found me, they found me because I came in to see Nikki's partner, Lenny, who I have the utmost respect for. I really do. Even to this day, Lenny was one of my favorite people. He was just a gregarious guy, always always smiling, always he was just a nice guy to be around. He had a nice persona about him. He had called me in for something, and I went in to go and see him. He was out on bail on a case, and I was on the run. Nikki was pinched already. I spoke to him, and the way that I got it from the agents is that they were watching him. When they watched him, they got a line on me when I went to go and see him. And when they went to go and see, when, when I left, then they got where I was staying. When they got where I was staying, they sat on the location for a number of days. They went to another location where they knew I would frequent, and they had surveillance on both locations. Then they came, they pinched me one morning, and then when they pinched me, they started talking about wanting to talk to me on that day. I stonewalled them, of course, because I did my regular thing. But then what happened was when I went to my um, arraignment, when I went to my arraignment, I knew I couldn't get bail because I had a parole hold. I knew I wasn't getting out. I knew they were going to hold me. Now, the lawyer that they brought for me was a guy, and they didn't, and when they brought the lawyer, Gary, the lawyer wasn't because they were looking out for me. <laughs> the lawyer was there because they was looking out for them. You understand the difference? Yeah, I get it. They put, a, they put a lawyer there to see what the charges were because they knew that I was under suspicion of the double homicide, and they wanted to see if I got charged with it, and they wanted to see what the charges were going to be and if it was, you know, RICO related or anything that I had to do with them. So the lawyer was there for that purpose and that purpose only. And I just didn't like the whole feel of it. So I told the lawyer, I said, listen, you're here. He's absolutely nothing. And I said, they're going to remand me no matter what. You can't do nothing for me. If I'm going to use a lawyer, it's going to be JoJo anyway. I'm going to use JoJo. I'll call him when I get back inside. When I was in the Brooklyn House of Detention at the time. The feds came two days later and they rearrested me for federal charges. And when they rearrested me, they took me in. And then that's when they discussed with me about my life being in danger. You know it and I know what they said. You know you're getting clipped. We know you're getting. If we know you're getting clipped and you don't know it yet, you're the only guy who don't know it. You know, all the lights bulbs were going off in my head. I got to be somebody I was born to hate, Gary. I was born to hate the person that I had to be. And, you know, it goes against every instinct that you have. What are my options? These guys are going to kill me. Whatever chance they get, whenever they get that chance, it's coming. I'm not proud of it. I'm definitely not proud of it. I'm not proud of any of the criminal activity I was involved in. But I made a phone call, and I made the arrangement, and it happened. And the rest is history. And here I am today. But you know what? I got to do something I never did. I got to spend time with my family. I never spent time with my family. To me, giving your family money was being a man. I, I missed the best years of my son growing up. And these are things that, you know, the, the collateral damage around you. Now it was time to be that person to, to start to do what was right for me and maybe live out to my potential and stuff like that. It had nothing to do with jail time. I've been in jail my whole life. This had nothing to do with not wanting to go to jail. More of my friends were in jail than out of jail. The whole idea was to go to jail for them, knowing that my wife was for welfare the first time. Now they're looking to kill me the second time. How many times were I going to kick myself in the ass? Basically, that's it. Now here I am talking to you. That's taking loyalty a little bit too far, I think. Uh, uh, but, you know. And, 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 and I was that guy. I was that guy. I ate and bred that guy. That was me. You know, I, I, I see all these people with these talk shows and all this thing or whatever. And, you know, it's very easy to judge a person until you go through these things, until you're affected in the same way and you deal 
with the ugly side of that life. Yeah. You know, just because you're good at what you do, Gary, and you report all your money and you do all these things, that doesn't grant you safe passage. In this life, guys get killed for being too good at what they do, out of jealousy, out of envy. You're dealing with the most ruthless people in the world. Everybody starts to lose track of that because they watch too much TV and they watch too much glorification. But you're with the scum of the earth. And I was I was no different. Believe me, I'm no better. Well, you're on a different plain and simple. You're on a different path now. Sounds to me I'm like, definitely on a different path, brother. I I, I, I do other things. I you know <laughs> I don't, I'm happy. I don't think you're you're doing the things that you used to do. Uh, if you did, you wouldn't be out. No, there those days are over, Gary. <laughs> They're just stories that we tell. Yeah. Well, what I do is I just take all the precautions that I did when I was in the street because yeah. they wanted me dead then. They wanted me dead now. There's no different levels of dead. So I take the same precautions I always did. I carry myself in the same fashion. I always know that someday my path can't catch up with me. And when it does, Gary... I'm going to do what I always did, and I'm going to die like a man that day, whenever it may be, and we're going to do what we need to do. I don't want it to happen. I don't wish it to happen, but that's the only day that I would ever break the law again, and that is to protect my loved ones and to protect myself, and then let the chips fall where they may. And I'm not trying to be tough here. I'm just saying it the way it is. Gary, you're a gentleman. Whenever you want to speak, I'll speak to you anytime, right. and it was good to talk to you, and yeah, I hope, this, this I'm was glad great. you're doing well. Uh, I'm glad you're doing well. And, and All right. And if this you got grandkids, yeah, I'm doing do well, sir. Thank you very much for asking. Do you have grandkids? As a matter of fact, I wish. I, I wish. By, not yet. Not that I know of yet. And uh, All right, sir. We'll let, you get on, we'll let you get on about your business, and I appreciate it. If there's ever anything I can do for you, don't hesitate to uh, get hold of me. And you've, uh, I will, sir. Hey, listen, send me a copy of this. I would love to hear it. I, I will. I'll, what I'll do is... Uh, I'll, uh, when I, I'll put it up and then I'll, uh, uh, send you a link and you can download it. And then you can have your own copy of it. How about that? All my best to you and your family guys right. for a happy holiday. Be safe. Okay. You Enjoy too. your happy good holiday. new year with all the health in the world. Okay. You too. That was a good one. Wasn't it guys? Now don't forget if you've got a problem with PTSD, you need to go to the VA website. If you were in the service or you know, somebody it was because they have a hotline and a lot of help available for the PTSD. Uh, if you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, our good friend, Anthony Ruggiano has a hotline number and his website. And I've got that up here if you're in the YouTube. So don't forget to like and subscribe and click on some of my other ones. And if you're on the audio, you know, give me a review and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, I don't know. Just listen. I, I have a good time doing it. I hope you guys have a good time listening. Thanks a lot, guys.